Nothing is but happy to be in church this morning. Are you sure you are happy to be in church? Can somebody shout, praise the Lord. You see, the Lord is on the throne. You want to turn to somebody and say, you are blessed and highly favored. Is it irrespective of whatever that is happening as children of God? You are blessed and you are highly favored. See, for as many of us that are here this morning that have not been able to meet up with, I want to say good morning to everyone. The Lord has brought you and has ordered your step into the house this morning. And it has, it's my prayer that you will not return the same way you have come in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to appreciate the pastors for, for this privilege. I don't take I don't take for granted at all when I'm when I have when I'm working with God. I don't take I take my working with God as if that day is the last day. I may not have opportunity again another time to serve him or to do anything. That's the way I take my work with God. And it's my prayer that the Lord will brought every one of us to that understanding in the mighty name of Jesus. So God bless you, Pastor. The Lord will continue to move his church forward and the gate of prayer will not prevail against him in the mighty name of Jesus. You see, for what is happening in the world this day, I want to tell you, the Bible says in Psalm 91, that he that dwell in the secret place of the Lord shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But Brendan, let me, t let me ask you, there's a proviso to that scripture. It is not a memory verse. It is not for you to open and put under your pillow. It is not for you to just be reciting everywhere. There is something that you need to do. The Bible says, he that dwell in the secret place of the Lord. There is a secret place of God. And what is that secret place? Place of prayer. When you refuse to put yourself on that place of prayer, you will be affected. When the Bible says, they that dwell under the secret place of the Lord shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Brother, don't be moved by whatever you see around you. If you read that scripture throughout, it says, a thousand might fall on your side. Ten thousand on your right hand side. So it will not come near you. That is the word of the Lord. I am strongly moved by the word of God. Because nothing changes the word of God. <clears throat> Brethren, let me tell you, you see, for many of us that are involved actively in evangelism in this nation, I've been involved actively, actively. You see, it has been my prayer. My wife is seated here. It has been my prayer. I prayed this several times. I said, God, let this nation, let this part of the world return to you. Do something. I've always been praying. I said, Some, Lord, do something that will cause this part of the world. And so this part of the world, has we are so much dependent on system. I remember a couple of years back, I was doing evangelism in Stafford. And I met with a guy, a, 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 the same color of my, like myself. And he began to argue with me. He said, why do we need God? He said, we don't need God again. He said, we have been to the moon. We have been to, ev to the space. We have been to everywhere. We almost get to God now. He said, so why do we need him? We don't need him for anything. I said, wow, that is great. I said, God will do something that will cause you to know that you need him. Because the Bible says the earth is the Lord. This earth belongs to him. And he can decide to do whatever he likes with it. So he can decide to send coronavirus to the earth. You can't stop him. That's nothing you are going to do. It's his word. He created you. And if you know that he created you, you better run to him. For as many of us that followed the tweeting of the President of the United States, he tweeted, he said he has declared today a day of prayer in the United States. He said, in times like this, Americans are only look on to God. I said, this, this part of the world will return to God. I remember my, I remember our father in the Lord, one in the meeting that he did with pastors in, in sometimes in uh, Jesus' house, he said something, he said, because of him, 
He said he's regularly on his knee praying. He said United Kingdom will return to God. And something will cause this to happen. It's not, it's not going to happen just like that. Brethren, if you, if you go out there, you listen to what people say. People are disdaining God. They are looking down on God as if they created themselves. They have, so, they have gotten to the position whereby they believe that way. Why do I need him? <laughs> but I can tell you everyone on earth needs God. It only, it, it only takes God to cough. And the whole, world, the whole world will shake. It only takes him to just cough and the whole world will shake. My prayer is that in this time like this, every one of us will depend on him. Yeah. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. Don't be panicked. Don't go about with all this panic buying. <laughs> it's not part of the message. You see, I, normally I do my shopping later in the evening where everywhere is the crowd has gone. But yesterday I just <laughs> said, let me go and do my shopping. By the time I got there, about a crowd. I was looking everywhere on the shelf. I couldn't find anything. I said, what's going on? <laughs> a, and a, a white lady that, that was just beside me says, the one has gone upside down. Say, Why are you doing this? As a child of God, my Bible tells me, even in the days of famine, in during the time of Elijah, Elijah was fed by raven. When the widow of Zarephath was there, he never, she never lacked during the time of famine. Even if there's going to be famine on the surface of the earth, I and my household will not lack. Because there is a God in heaven that rules in the affairs of men. And brethren, let me, tell, let me encourage us with this scripture. You see, when the Lord will say it's enough, he knows when it is enough. In the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 30, if you read, when, when David sinned against the Lord, and the Lord sent an angel to begin to destroy the, the entire, the, the people. You see, the Bible says, when that angel got to the vineyard of Erona, the Almighty God looked from above, and he says, enough. He said, it is enough. I will read it to us. That is verse 16. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, it is enough. The Lord knows when it is enough. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just dwell under the shadow of the almighty God and you are secured and you are saved. For your children and your entire household, no evil shall come near them. Whatever they call it, it will not come near you. That is my confidence. That's my belief. And I am moved by the word of God. And I want you to hold on to the word of God, and it shall be well with you and your entire household in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we just want to bless your name this morning. What a faithful God. What an awesome God. What a mighty God you are. The Lord that doeth wonders. There's no one that is like you. You are more than able. You can do exceedingly abundantly. You reign it forevermore. Father, here we are your children that you have redeemed. We have come unto you today, Holy Spirit. Father, in heaven, bless us in Jesus' name. Mighty God, it's time to hear from your throne of grace. Open our ears of understanding. Open our heart to receive from you. Almighty God, illuminate our understanding, Lord. My Father in heaven, the word say the word of God is sharper than two edged to edge sword. Father, let your word pierce every soul in the mighty name of Jesus. Through your word, Holy Spirit, Lord, let there be deliverance. Let there be healing and let your name be glorified. Lord, I submit myself unto you, just a jar of clay. The word says, Lord, that day we have a treasure in this earthly vessel. That the excellency and the power of God may be revealed. Father, this morning let your power be revealed. Lord, through your word, let your power be revealed. Let there be signs. 
and let there be wonders. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Be magnified, ancient of days. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning, we will be, we'll be traveling through the word of God. And I, I want us to diligently follow every bit of the word. More than I can explain the word of God, it is my prayer that the Almighty God will, es will explain and illuminate our heart in Jesus' name. But let me, let me, let me sign a note of caution this morning. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36, verse 26, the Bible says, A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will put away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Brethren, I want to encourage you this morning. Don't be stone-hearted against the word of God. The word of God is the word of God. Nothing changes it. Modernization will never change it. There's nothing that will invalidate the word of God, and nothing will water it down. But I want to encourage, I want to, I want to, I want to plead with you: let the word of God penetrate into you. Take out your understanding. Take out your little brain. Take out this little chicken brain that we have. It's not compared with the understanding of the of the Almighty God. This morning, let the word of God. Just lean upon the Holy Spirit. Just lean upon God and say, Lord, give me understanding of this word. I'm a baby, I'm a child. Teach me your word. And the Lord will minister to you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Today, this year, 2020, we call it year of vision. Year of vision. But I can tell you clearly that vision does not just emerge. You have to consciously prepare for it. You have to eagerly await it, as the book of Habakkuk says. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse uh, 3. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. Habakkuk 2, verse 3. Habakkuk 2, verse 3 says, Say, for the vision is here for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Though it tarries, wait for it. For as many of us that were in uh, at the VG on Friday, I congratulate you that you are around. The blessing that the Lord has given you, the devil will not take it away. In the mighty name of Jesus. But let me tell you, the Bible says God speaks once in, in Psalm 62, verse 11. But twice have I heard. The man of God says, when you hear it the second time, it's an echo. So he speaks once. The second time it comes to you, it's echo. If you hear it the third time, it is the echo. He has spoken just once. The word of God is the same. That's why I say I congratulate you. You see, whatever you are hearing now again, don't think as a result of what happened on Friday. I can tell you before God, I'm standing on his throne, on his poop, uh, here on the 22nd of February when Pastor sent a text to me concerning this message. That was the day God gave this message to me. 22nd of February. That was the day that God gave me the topic for this message and I just scribbled it down. And before Friday, I'd already put this together. So whatever that happens together on Friday was not as a result of what you are going to hear today. It is just to confirm again to you that the word of God, that God speaks once. You're hearing it the second time. But let me tell you, it's an echo that you are hearing. You better hold on to the word of God. Praise the Lord. It is very common, it is very common for many of us to safely say, safely say it. I say it as well. Now, you know what? I'm not called to be a pastor. I'm not called to be a teacher. I'm not called to be a bishop. I'm not called to be an evangelist. I'm not called to be a prophet. 
But there is something that I want to tell everyone of us this morning. That there is, a call, there is a general call upon every one of us. There is a call that the God of heaven has made upon your life. And we'll be looking at some of those calls this morning. And the title of the message is simply the old rugged call. The old rugged call. If, if you have not been writing, when you were writing, when you come to the house of God, today a, a word of God might jump at you. So you write it down. Let it ever list with you. See how well we have answered this call that tied to the old rugged call. How well we are doing regarding this call. It's not for me to determine. No. It's not for me to judge. But I want the word of God to judge you this morning. I want the word of God to assess you this morning. And as the word assesses you, you assess yourself. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. And it reads, examine yourself as to know whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. No man is testing you now. You test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves? That Jesus is in you. Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. So examine yourself. Let not any man examine you. Examine yourself. And it's my prayer that as you examine yourself this morning, the mighty God will reveal to you every inadequacy in your life and make you whole in the mighty name of Jesus. The old rugged call. When you say something is rugged, in the English word, rugged, rugged just means strongly made, very strong, capable of withstanding rough handling, very strong, tough, resilient. And we know the opposite of all this is flimsy. So when I say old rugged call, let's have that, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's have at the back of our mind that rugged. In other words, the call that you have been called unto by the Almighty God is not a flimsy one. It's a very strong call. And it requires you to be very strong. It requires you and I to be rugged. To be resilient in that journey. And when we say old, we all know what is old. I think I'm getting old because I wasn't the way I used to be. This year, every one of us will be a year older. Good. So we are getting old. We know what, what it means to be old. And I said, the old rugged call, that call is old. It's an old call. It's not a new call. The generation we are in now will not will not change the call. It's a new call. It's, a, it's an old call. And I can tell you it is old because the one that made the call is old. Because the Bible calls him the ancient of days. In the book of Daniel chapter 7 verse 8, when you read Psalm 90, Psalm 90 verse 2, Daniel 7 8, Psalm 90 verse 2, the Bible calls him the ancient of days. It's old. And because it's old, the call he has made is old. And we know that nothing changes God. <laughs> it's old and it's new. So that is why I can tell you this morning that the call is an old, rugged call. Praise the Lord. And the first old, rugged call is the call to carry your cross. The call to carry your cross. 
many of us have read this over and over again. Why this morning I will try as much as possible to just unravel some things from that. The Bible in the book of Luke, chapter 9. If you are not with your Bible, you are with your phone, just tap into it. Yeah, you are welcome. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Luke chapter 9. You ta just tap into it. Well, I will read various versions. That's why I'm having my phone here too. I'm having my phone here to just travel because I travel through lots of various uh, version of the Bible. So I want to, I want I want to bring some things out from those versions. I'll be reading the Amplified version, Luke chapter nine, verse twenty-two. Luke chapter nine, verse twenty-two. Luke chapter nine, verse twenty-two. And the Bible, no, verse 23, and the Bible reads, And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to follow me, in the Amplified, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself, that is, set aside selfish interest, and take up his cross daily. That means expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. And follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living. And if I need be suff and if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of me, because of faith in me. You know, I've just uh, uh, that ampli uh, in the Amplified Version elaborated a little bit on that. And let me break that scripture a a one by one. The Bible says you should deny yourself. When the Bible says you should deny yourself, it's telling you, set aside all your You see, this, uh, this attitude of I, me. You see, as a child of God, you have to follow God, you have to follow Christ, you see, that you remove that word, I, from your dictionary. It's no longer about you. It's about him that has called you to himself. Because in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Apostle Paul said, so I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. The, the life that I live in this body is no longer of myself. So if you're a child of God, I am born again, um, I, I've given my life to Christ, you are still saying, hey, they are doing that to me. Hey, why me? Uh, why not you? Remove that word, I, 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 I. It's, it's no longer about you, it's about Christ. The self must die, must give way. And death on the cross, on the cross, if you know, if we, le le let me just explain a little bit to us. When you say Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he says, see, he that will follow me should, should carry his cross and follow me. You see, in the Roman days, death on the cross is a form of execution used by Rome for dangerous criminals. Not for just any ordinary, any ordinary person, for dangerous criminals. Our Lord Jesus Christ was not a criminal. You and I know that. He's the son of God. But he endured the death on the cross. So that you and I, that is the original criminal. You and I, we are the original criminal. Right? He endured the cross, the death of the cross. So that you and I, the original criminal. Why are we original criminal? The first man. And the first woman, they flout the order of God. The pastor is here, he's a, he's a lawyer. When you flout the, a law, you become a criminal. And you know, you are, being you are going to be dealt with according to the law. But so that you and I will not, will not continue to live under the law and get continuously punished. You have to send his only begotten son to die on the cross, to Become a criminal. 
But you know, unfortunately, many are still living as a criminal. Many are still denying him. Many say, I don't have anything to do with him. He's still a criminal. My prayer is that the mighty God will set every one of us free in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. You see, the, cor- the cross we are called to carry. You know, when you, hear, you, you might have heard people saying, hey, it is my cross. Hey, I'm carrying my cross. You see, the cross that God has called you to carry is not a problem. God has not called you to carry problem and follow him. No. God has not called you to carry suffering and say, oh, this is my own cross, suffering, and I'm following him. No. It's not even challenges that he has called you to carry and follow him. But I'm not, the, I'm, not, I'm not saying those challenges will not be there. I'm not saying the whatever you are going through will not be there. But it's not saying carry your problem on your head and be following me. No. What God is saying is that there must be a decision. You see, when you get to the crossroad, you, get conf- you don't know where to go. But you need to take a decision. At the crossroad, you have to take a decision. So God is telling you, get to the point of taking a decision. Get to the point where you take a decision. Say, behold the old rugged cross. The cross of Christ is not something to be adorned. You don't, you can't even, you don't even want, you don't even, it's not something that you can see that is so attractive. No matter how we do it today, you see some cross that is, that is made with uh, silver and gold. That's not the cross Jesus Christ carried. The cross, you see, you behold the old rugged cross and you look at the one that is on it and you take a decision. That is the cross. You take a decision, I need to follow him now. You see, Peter got to a point in his life there was a problem he had. The Bible said they toyed all night. And what happened? They caught nothing. So that's why I said the problem will still be there. But it's not saying bring the problem and carry it and follow me. No. Because Peter, when God wanted to deal with Peter, what did he do? He showed to Peter that, you know what? I'm not calling you to a life of problem. What did he first, what did he first do? He sought out that problem. He said to him, you have toiled all night. You've caught nothing. Okay, no problem, son. Can you just launch out into the deep? And Peter said, oh, we will try this. I'm a best fisherman on that. I've never seen you fish. But I think as a professional, let me just listen to a bit of, a piece of, a piece, this piece of advice. And he did. And he caught something. The Bible said they abandoned all. And they followed him. Praise the Lord. You see, somebody will have a thing this morning. You might have given your life to Christ th- on, uh, 10, 5 years ago, but that's th- I've been a missing link. You can return back to him. You see, carrying the cross. Following God is not all about coming to church. No. It's not, like, oh, I come to church, I'm a member of Redeem, I'm a member of Winners. Oh, you can be a member of Redeem. You can be a member of Winners. No. You need to answer that call personally. I remember telling my young, my young, my young men and ladies, the teenagers, when I was explaining to them that you need to give your life to Christ. Somebody was, one of them was saying, hey, it's, it's, well, gradually I will do it. I said, it's not gradually. <laughs> Carrying your cross, following God, is an instantaneous decision that you take. It's not a gradual thing. And I had to explain to them that, you know what, the one that is gradual, the one that is gradual, is different. Sanctification is a gradual thing. 
It's a process. It's different from giving your life to Christ. Giving your life to Christ is instantaneous. Instantly, something must come into you. In physics, he said that nature abhors vacuum. There's nothing that is vacuum. If you see it, if you see a container that, is, that, you, are, that you are carrying, it's not empty. There's something inside that container that's air. The moment you are filling that container with water, what happened? The air starts escaping. And I said, there is no man that is empty. Your spirit harbors another spirit. Is that the spirit of God? The spirit of the devil. And at the point when you surrender to him, instantaneously the spirit of the devil jumps out of you. The spirit of God comes into you, resides in you. Praise the Lord. You see, there must be willingness. You see, it's not, it's not, it's nobody, it's not somebody just cajoling you or somebody just uh, trying to force you. I remember my, my, my early days when I was living with my uncle. It, it's like he was forcing us to give our life to Christ. I will go to church, he will be looking. Are you going to give your life to Christ? By the time we got, we got back home, we said, why didn't you give your life? <laughs> I said, come on, take it easy now. This was like a force. He will take us to church the following Sunday. We will go to church. By the time they make an altar call, I will sit down there. I said, this boy. But you need to get to a point that God will meet with you. And at that point, just like what happens to Saul on his way to Damascus, when God, ha- when God meet up with you, you will know that, yes, this is God. Nobody needs to force you at that time. You surrender to him. Praise the Lord. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse, uh, 20, verse, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Looking away from all that will distract us. Looking away from all that will distract us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who who initiates the perfect of of our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding his shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. That is the one that we need to surrender to. It's not to any man. It's to him. It's to him. But brethren, I want to encourage you this morning. Don't become a, don't be, don't live a life of an enemy of the cross. Because in the cross, your, your destiny will be fulfilled. In the cross, you have eternal life. Don't live as an enemy of the cross. If you, when we read the the the, 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 situ- the situation can be likened to the to the to the situation of the children of Israel when they were traveling through the journey from Mount Hall from from Mount Hall in the book of Numbers chapter twenty one, Numbers chapter twenty one from verse four to nine, Numbers twenty one. Numbers 21 from verse 4 to 9. And the journey from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against, Mo- against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul lords this little bread. And the Lord sent a fiery serpent among the people. And they beat the people and most people of Israel died. You see, they got to the point. They just, God. 
We don't need this God. They say any, whatever they like against him. And that's why I say, don't become an enemy of, of Christ. Don't become an enemy of the cross. The life, we can say, oh, well, nothing happened. He said, there's an adage, adage where I come from. He said, a young child look at uh, an Iroko tree. And he decides to curse it. And he ran away. And he thinks the day you curse an Iroko tree, that's the day the, the tree will kill you. No. It's not that day. God gives a long rope. God gives enough time for everyone on earth to repent. And I can tell you, brethren, tomorrow might be late. If you don't do it now, tomorrow might be late. Praise the Lord. So don't live your life as an enemy of, of, of the cross. Do we have the teenagers in the, in the, in the here? Because I want, I have, when I prepare this, I have them in mind. And God wants to speak to them. Can you please, if they can come in here. Ah, please, please. I just, there is something, there is a message for them. You see, as, as, as parents, as adults, if care is not taken, they will be not to be blamed. It is you and I that will be blamed. You see, I've heard people saying, "Will there be church again?" If this, with the way this, these children are going, it is what you are doing, what I am doing, that will make the church not to be in their own time. It is not what they are going to do. If you have ever gone to all the churches in the United Kingdom, go to the Anglican, go to the Church of England. If you ever attempt to go there, who do you see? Old people. Old people. You don't see the younger one. But sometimes, if I, there, was a, there is a road, if you go around uh, Notumba land, in, uh, around Bestley, I can't tell the number of churches, the big churches that were built. I can't tell, they were just on the street, about five massive ones. And some Sundays, they will not be open. And I said, when these were built, who were the people that were attending the churches? They were their forefathers. But what did they do to hand over this to their own children? Yes, not taking what we are doing. The way we are taking the word of God. The way we are using our own knowledge. Our own little brain to rationalize the word of God. We affect them. Because the Bible says in the book of First, First Corinthians chapter 1. Can you read verse 14, 15? Say the preaching of the cross is to them that are perished. But to them that are redeemed. Says it's the word of God. It's very simple. Don't let us complicate things for them. You see, I've seen where we complicate the word of God for these little ones. And they are confused. And they are confused. My prayer is that, you see, the mighty God of heaven, because the, God, the God, word of God says, say, no matter what, let the whole world decided that we are not going to serve God. God says, I have reserved for myself. Uh, among them, there are reserves. When Elijah was telling God, he said, God, I have been, I have been, I have been passionate for you. I have been the one that has been so jealous of, for you. I have done this for you. I have done that for you. It's only me that remains as your prophet. God says, shut up. I have in reserve 7,000 that have not bowed down to Baal. 7,000. To everyone that refuses to do the things of God, there's 7,000 in the place. Praise the Lord. I've talked about the old rugged call. To my young ladies and young men, I want you to listen to me carefully this morning. 
There is a call upon your life to follow the old path. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah chapter 6, he said, I'm going to travel to the, to, I'm, do, I'm going to travel through the version of the Bible that you will clearly understand. That is the message version. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 6, I want you to tap your phone. I think all of you have your phone. Tap, your, tap to your phone into Jeremiah chapter 6 and just travel with me. Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, I'm going to read to us verse uh, 16. Jeremiah 6, 16. The Bible says, this is what the Lord says, not me. So remove me from the equation now. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroad and look around. Ask for the old godly way. Are you listening to me? Tell me, Dio, are you hearing me? The Bible says, stop at the crossroad. Ask for the old. It's not a new, it's not new, very old. So you need to, what you need to do, ask mommy, the old. The old godly way. Not the way of the world today that seems right to every one of you. But the Bible says there is a way that is similar unto a man. But the end thereof is what? Destruction. He said, and walk in it. He said, travel his path. And you will find rest for your soul. But you reply, no. That's not the road we want. I pray you will not say no. To the old path that the Lord is calling you into. In the mighty name of Jesus. The Bible says in a book in, a, in Psalm 119, verse uh, 9 to 11. So where with that shall a young man cleanse his way? Where we shall a young boy, shall a young girl cleanse his way? Is it not by taking heed? Taking heed. Listen. Taking heed to the word of God. Not the word of your friends. Are you listening to me? Not the word of your friends. The word of God. But I can tell you the truth. The only one that can give you the exact and the truth. That loves you more than any, anything else. Yeah, your mother and your father. If you think I, I've got a friend. He so much love me. He's my best friend. Oh, you soon realize that the Bible says a friend indeed is a friend in need. When you are in trouble, that's when you know the, the, the real friend. When you are in trouble, that's when you know the real friend. You see, under the call to follow the old path, you know, there is a call that the Lord has placed on you. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, verse, uh, verses 1 to 3, or verses 2 to 3. Let me start reading from verses, two to, verses 1 to 3. It says, children, I'm, sti I want, I'm still reading the, the message version. It says, children, do what your parent tells you. Do you hear that? He didn't say do some of the things. He said do what your parent tells you. This is only right. Honor your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it. And what is that promise? So you will live well and have a long life. Mommy and daddy are saying to you, there's a lion out there. I'm just coming, I'm just coming from that place and I'm coming in now. I can see a, a, a leopard or a lion right there. You are saying that no, mommy and daddy is a sheep, not a leopard. 
Go there and try and see whether it's a sheep or leopard. There's a difference between a sheep and a leopard. But for your own sake, you better listen. When you are looking for a job in this country, they will always tell you if you, if you, if you are a fresh graduate, you are looking for a job. They, what, what, would they, what would they normally say? You don't have experience. Am I right? Whether you don't have experience, some job will put in their specification of 10 years' experience. Why are they doing that? Uh, because there is someone that has experience knows better. There is no experience that you've got on earth. See, the road, that, the, journey, the road you are going through, the journey you are passing through, somebody has passed through it. Someone has passed through the same journey. You see, when King David got to the point he was about to die, the Bible says he called all the Israel and he called his son, Solomon, and he said something to him, which I'm going to read to us in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. I will read from, I will read verse 9. First Chronicle 28. First Chronicle 28, verse 9, and it says, And you, Solomon, my son, get to know where your father's God. Serve him with a whole heart and eager mind. For God examines every heart and sees every moti- and see through every motive. You, can you see a father giving advice to his son? He said, you know what? The only one that has sustained me all through my journey on this throne is this God. And he's telling him, you better follow him. You better go with him. We all know that God loves uh, David so much. That the Bible, the Bible referred to David as a man after God's heart. Because he said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. But if you study your Bible very well, despite the love that God has for him, every mistake that David made, God punished. So if mommy and daddy is punishing you, don't think they hate you. They so much love you. The Bible says, David is a man after my heart. Despite that, when he made mistake, God still deal with him. God still punish him. You know, I remember one day I was talking to every one of you right there in, 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 in our meeting. I said, don't allow your teenage face don't allow your teenage stage of life to destroy other phases of your life. You know, the teenage age is just a phase. The teenage age is just a phase. You graduate from there to another age. But some have, have allowed that age, that phase, to destroy what? The other phases. My prayer is that you will not live a life of regret. In the mighty name of Jesus. And as mommy and daddy, nobody, none of us will live a life of regret. David got to a point in his lifetime. The Bible recorded the greatest regret that David had. It was a question that was asked when our father in the Lord was ministering a message. He, say, he asked a question. He said, what was the greatest regret that David had? And everybody was saying so many things. But it's recorded in the Bible. If you read the book of uh, if you read the book of Second Chronicles chapter twenty eight, read it verse two and three. The Bible says, David said himself, he said, "I desire to build a house for my God. I desire to build a house for my God." 
I made preparation. I did everything. But God said what? No. God said no. Say why? Because you have been a man of war and your hands are with blood. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter, chapter is it chapter 13 or verse 6? It says, six things the Lord hates. Sevens are abomination unto him. The man that shed, the hands that shed innocent blood. It was a regret that he lived with. And that's why I'm praying for every one of us. You will not do things in your life that you will get to a point at your latter age and you will regret. And to my young ones, you see, my prayer for you every day, when I come, even before I come to teach, with, to teach you every Sunday, I, I go on my knees to pray for you. I say, Lord, don't let these children live a life of regret. Because it will be costly. We are in a nation, we are in a generation that is just too riotous. We are in a generation, we are in a, we are, we are in a, in a, in a generation that, that, that thinks I can just do anything. But not with God. Not with God. Not with God. Praise the Lord. You see, I'm not going to, this, just like what pastor says, when you prepare a message, don't ever think you can deliver a message that you prepare within 40 minutes. If I'm to preach this message, I, can, I will preach this message for the next three hours. But that's why I've, I've sat under the, under the grace of God to put together and with the help of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to round it up where I'm talking to the, to the teenagers. I'm going to leave the rest. When the opportunity comes, we will, t- we will talk again. As many of us that know the story of Rehoboam in the Bible, Rehoboam happens to be the son of Solomon. We all know very well that when Solomon, how many of us know that Solomon did not end well? I read your Bible very well. Despite Solo, the same Solomon that cried to God and God gave him wisdom, gave him knowledge, gave him words, gave him everything. Go and read your Bible very well. He ended badly. It was because of what Solomon did that God said, I'm going to tear the kingdom away from the house of David. That was what God said. He said, I will tear it away. And he did. But he said, I'm not going to do it while Solomon is still on the throne because of of David. I will do it after he has gone. And when his son, Rehoboam, came to the throne, the Lord did it. Can you see the foolishness of Rehoboam himself? When he came to the throne, the people of, the, of God came to him and asked him, I said, your father dealt with us badly. Your father punishes us. Your father did all manner of things to us. He said, now you are now the king. Are you going to do the same thing to us as your father did? He said, okay. Is this, okay, I don't know what to answer you now. But give me some days. In seven days' time, you will return. Can you return to me? He said, okay. Everybody left. Now, Rehoboam went and took counsel from the people that were advisors to his parents. And they told him, he said, this is what you should do to them. Follow what they are asking you. Do what they are asking you to do. Deal with them nicely. So that it can be well with you on the throne. That was elderly advice. Advice from his parents to him. But he said, this is a rubbish advice. It doesn't sound with 21st century. It doesn't sound with my generation. It doesn't sound with my generation Z. I need to go and take counsel from the people I grew up with. So he went. Took counsel from his advisor, from his young boys that are with him. You know what they told him? They said to him, said, ah, tell them that they've not seen anything. That your little finger will be more than, more than the biggest thing that their father did, that your father did. They tell them that my father whip you with a horse whip. I'm going to whip you with scorpion. 
Can you see? Those are the advice they gave to him. And he took that advice. The people came back the seventh day. He told them exactly. He told them exactly the same thing. What am I saying to you? My young, my young men and ladies, your friends, don't know better than you. They don't know better than you. Let me tell you, that's the truth. Same thing I tell my children. Say, your friends don't know better than you. It's like the blind leading the blind. I'm your parents. I know better and I will tell you the way. Brethren, don't walk out on the Lord. Because of our time, you see, when you read Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 13, the people of God were being advised, don't walk out on God. I'm encouraging you this morning, my young men, my young guys, don't walk out on God. In God, your life will be fulfilled. And it's my prayer that every one of you in this land, as the word of God says, that you shall be the head. And not the day you will forever be the head. In the mighty name of Jesus. This is my prayer for every teenager, every young man and boy and girl that we have in this church. Is that they shall be an example. You see, when you say example, I always say it. I said the Bible says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. There are good in this land. But the Bible says, if you are willing and obedient, there's nothing that can replace that. Willing and obedient. As my, my prayer for you, is that you see, in the heart of every child, eh, there's disobedience. There's propensity for every child to disobey. For the counsel of God, the word of God, the word of God is a direction. We give direction. And it's my prayer that the word of God will direct you. And that is why you parents come in. You can only give what you have. You cannot give what you don't have. The Bible says in, in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Teaching and, ab and ab ad admonishing one another. How do you teach your child? How do you admonish your child without the word of Christ dwelling inside of you richly? As you bow down our head this morning, but then talk to the Almighty God. If you have been the one that is so far away from the word of God, I've cut, to, I've cut the, the sermon into 30%. Then just talk to God that, Lord, it is time for me to move close to you. It is time for me to find my way to you. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 3, it says, return to me and I will return to you. But it's time for us to return to God. The time and the season we are in are precarious. They are delicate, dangerous. And without Christ, without God on your side, you might be consumed. Don't tell the Almighty God that, Lord, I return to you. Just help me, Lord. Just help me, Lord. Let me be a good example for this one. Tell, your, tell God, if you, are you, if you are a youth, if you are a teenager, tell the Almighty God that, Lord, don't let my life be destroyed. The Bible says evil communication corrupts good manner. Just need you to try to pray to the Almighty God. If 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 you if you think you have been far away from Him, tell Him that Lord, I come home like the prodigal son.